Have you ever wondered how words such as awful and terrific got their modern day meanings quite different from what they meant in the beginning? The word awful in modern usage is an expression of something bad or vile, certainly far from an emotion that was supposed to have left us full of awe. Likewise, the word terrific has its roots in the word terror, which means to frighten. Yet I would hardly think that a terrific review of this educational video would have anything to do with how successful I was in giving you nightmares. Semantic shifts in language are not uncommon. In fact, these are markers of unchanging times, as cultures and generations adapt common words and create new meaning. Today, I would like to explore the semantic and cultural shifts in the use of profanities in new media. With the sheer ubiquity of media in modern culture, censorship has become tricky. Just 40 years ago, the top hits could not have profanities in them, although some of them were peppered with innuendos. In 2017, a study on American culture by Twang et al. found that books published in 2005 to 2008 were 28 times more likely to include swear words than books published in the early 1950s. Increase for individual swear words ranged from 4 to 678 times. Today, a look at the global top 50 playlists on Spotify shows us that 60% of the songs have explicit language in them, most notably the F-word, This reflects its already ubiquitous use among youth. In fact, this is not a recent trend, but a cultural shift, influenced by the massive online presence of English-speaking social influencers from the UK, US, and Australia. Using vulgarities between friends has become an act of familiarity rather than insult. With more and more people joining the force in becoming new media prosumers, the proliferation of profanity-laden content is definitely more noticeable. Just take a look at this video found on TikTok. I just fucking love you, thanks for always being there. I'll never find anyone like you again anywhere. I can't imagine life without you and I never will. You're the wind beneath my wings and with you I'm fucking fulfilled. So if you get this video, please know that you are loved. Cause there's a person on this earth that thinks you're number one. Online censorship seems increasingly less effective or relevant. Granted, Spotify itself has an explicit content filter. But what about other social media websites where prosumers have found workarounds by misspelling profanities so as to beat the censorship system? Or using words to insinuate swear words, like fudge a whatever that means. With such evolution, the belief that we can preserve innocence by keeping teenagers far away from online profanities borders on naivety. They are already immersed in an environment that is rife with swear words. So how do these materials sit within the deliberation and selection process for educational use? Some English literature teachers may be familiar with the situation where an examination of a literary text has students giggling and laughing because of a few choice words used. What should teachers do? Pretend it does not exist? Approach senior management and call for greater prudency in choosing appropriate literature for school learning? Some schools adopt a more liberal approach to the presence of profanities in literature, where teachers educate students that it is simply a form of literary expression confining as a discussion to the text at hand. In no way would a teacher feel compelled to lower his or her standards of classroom decorum and permit the use of such language within the interactions between students or even with the teacher. With the presence of profanities now ever present in new media online, how should educators approach its use within classroom? The first approach would be to be very strict, carefully curating, restricting, and filtering out any online material that has profanities in them. The argument made here would be that schools should be a safe space, trusted by the parents for learners to engage in wholesome learning. Such a worldview sees the presence of profanities as a threat to good and moral character and should not be featured lest students be negatively influenced. The educator can see himself as a crusader fighting the war against profane and crude language use. This is true and important in protecting the innocence of young minds. However, given the ubiquity of social media, we must question how effective purely restrictive methods are as an educational approach and at what age the efficacy of such a restrictive approach begins to decline. 
which leads me to the second and more common approach in Singapore, where educators acknowledge its presence in new media, but avoid it as much as possible. They refrain from including it in their teaching resources, especially if there were alternative sources to be chosen from. Teachers, however, may find themselves occasionally dealing with profanities on a certain website, especially during tasks such as online research where students have a freer reign. The view remains that such language is taboo. In such situations, both educators and students exist momentarily in an awkward space. The material is quickly put aside and closed, and both educators and learners pretend that nothing ever happened. The third and final approach which this video proposes is that teachers should engage actively and deliberately with the presence of profanities online. This does not mean that teachers go on a hunt to select the most vulgar material for educational purposes. Instead, as with all other tricky topics, educators should be confident in teaching students how to navigate their encounters online and constantly model proper classroom decorum, whilst acknowledging that there is a social and cultural place for the use of profanities. Teachers must be prepared to distinguish between the use of profanities to insult versus that use to express intense emotions. Expressions such as WTF or that's f***ing awesome do little to tear down another and can be reserved for more informal settings amongst peers. However, educators should not be embarrassed of engaging critically with the students to deepen their understanding of how such words may be seen as harmful or offensive. Conversely, educators should remain open-minded that words that were once held as offensive may have lost their semantic power and increasingly become part of everyday expressions. But there are some noteworthy considerations we need to address. What exactly is our appetite? In my discussions with colleagues, many local teachers in Singapore are averse to engaging in discussions surrounding taboo topics such as profanities and sex. If we were to engage critically with our students, we must develop a common language, identify appropriate environments for its use, and provide resources for educators to be trained in effective engagement. Next, we need to hold in balance the reality that there are in fact children who have managed to remain sheltered from the commonplace profanities in their social circles, and may thus be negatively influenced. Without training in effective engagement, this openness to profanities as a natural part of youth culture that extends to the classroom could backfire. We do not want to taint the innocence of students who otherwise have little to no contact with profanities in social interactions. With the rapidly evolving nature of new media, a complete censorship of profanities may be a battle not worth fighting in the classroom of the 21st to the 22nd century. Educators, therefore, need to see themselves as moderators and guides, reclaiming their authority to shape the perceptive and interpretive lenses of learners in all aspects of their students' lives. In this case, in engaging in the use of profanities in the new media literature. Because if we don't teach them, he will. <laughs>